धीर जन प्रिय प्रिय कर रहो निर्मात And now chapter 46 Astonishment and Chivalry Lokanam hitakarinam tribhuvane mannam saranyakam nana Astonishment The ecstasy of astonishment in devotional service is perceived in two ways directly by the experience of one's own eyes and indirectly by hearing from others When Narad came to see the activities of the Lord at Dwarka and he saw that Krishna was present within every palace in the same body and was engaged in different activities he was struck with wonder This is one of the examples of astonishment in devotional service by direct perception. One of the friends of Mother Yashoda said, quote, "Yashoda, just see the fun. On the one hand, there is your child who is always captivated by sucking the milk from your breast, and on the other hand, there is the great Govardhan hill which can obstruct the passing of the clouds." but still just see how wonderful it is that this great govardhan hill is resting on the finger of your child's left hand just as though it were a toy is this not very mysterious Unquote. this statement is another example of astonishment in devotional service by direct perception An instance of astonishment in devotional service by indirect perception occurred when Maharaj Pariksit heard from Shukdev Goswami about Krishna's killing Narakasura who had been fighting Krishna with 11 Akshohini divisions of soldiers. Each division of Akshohini soldiers contained several thousand elephants, several thousand horses and chariots, and several hundreds of thousands of infantry soldiers. Narakasura possessed 11 such divisions and all of them were throwing arrows toward Krishna but Krishna killed them all simply by throwing 3 arrows from his side when Maharaj Pariksit heard of this wonderful victory he immediately rubbed the tears from his eyes and became overwhelmed with joy this instance is an example of astonishment in devotional service by indirect perception through oral reception There is another example of indirect astonishment. Trying to test Krishna to see if he were truly the supreme personality of Godhead, Lord Brahma stole all the cowherd boys and cows from him. But after a few seconds, he saw that Krishna was still present with all the cows, calves and cowherd boys, exactly in the same way as before. When Lord Brahma described this incident to his associates on the Satyaloka planet, they all became astonished. Brahma told them that after taking away all the boys, he saw Krishna again playing with the same boys in the same fashion. Their bodily complexion was blackish, almost like Krishna's, and they all had four arms. The same calves and cows were still present there in the same original fashion. Even while describing this incident Brahma became almost overwhelmed he added quote and the most astonishing thing was that many other brahmas from many different universes had also come there to worship krishna and his associates unquote similarly when there was a forest fire in the bandi ravana krishna instructed his friends to close their eyes tightly and they all did this Then when Krishna had extinguished the fire the cowherd boys opened their eyes and saw that they had been relieved from the danger and that their cows and calves were all safe 
they began to perceive the wonder of the situation simply by guessing how Krishna had saved them. This is another instance of indirect perception causing astonishment in devotional service. The activities of a person, even if they are not very extraordinary, create an impression of wonder in the heart and mind of the person's friends. But even very wonderful activities performed by a person who is not one's friend will not create any impression. It is because of love that one's wonderful activities create an impression in the mind. Chivalry. When on account of love and devotional service for the Lord there is special valorous enthusiasm, the resultant activities are called chivalrous. These chivalrous activities can be manifested in the acts of mock fighting, giving charity, showing mercy and executing religious principles. By performing chivalrous activities in fighting, one is called Yudha Vira. By charitable activities, one is called Dhanavira. By showing extraordinary mercy, one is called Dayavira. And when one is munificent in executing religious rites, he is called Dharmavira. In all such different chivalrous activities, Krishna is the object. When a friend wants to satisfy Krishna by performing some chivalrous activities, the friend becomes the challenger and Krishna himself becomes the opponent. Or else Krishna may give audience to the fighting and by his desire another friend becomes the opponent. A friend once challenged Krishna thus, quote, My dear Madhava, you are very restless because you think that no one can defeat you. But if you do not flee from here, then I shall show you how I can defeat you, and my friends will be very satisfied to see this." Unquote. Krishna and Sri Dhamma were very intimate friends, yet Sri Dhamma, out of anger with Krishna, challenged him. When both of them began to fight, all the friends on the bank of the Yamuna enjoyed the wonderful fighting of the two friends. They prepared some arrows for mock fighting and Krishna began to throw his arrows at Sri Dhamma. Sri Dhamma began to block these arrows by whirling his pole and by Sri Dhamma's chivalrous activities Krishna became very satisfied. Such mock fighting generally takes place among chivalrous persons and creates wonderful excitement for all viewers. There is a statement in the Hari Vamsha that sometimes Arjun and Krishna fought in the presence of Kunti and Arjun would be defeated by Krishna. In such chivalrous fighting between friends, there is sometimes bragging, complacence, pride, power, taking to weapons, challenging and standing as an opponent. All of these symptoms become impetuses to chivalrous devotional service. One friend challenged Krishna thus, quote, my dear friend Damodar, you are an expert only in eating. You have defeated Subala only because he is weak and you adopted cheating means. Don't advertise yourself to be a great fighter by such action. You have advertised yourself as a serpent and I am the peacock who will now defeat you." Unquote. The peacock is the ablest enemy of the serpent. In such fighting between friends, when the self-advertisement becomes personal, learned scholars say that it is sub-ecstasy. When there is a roaring challenge, certain kinds of movement for fighting, enthusiasm, no weapons, and assurance given to frightened witnesses, all these chivalrous activities are called sub-ecstasy. 
one friend addressed Krishna in this manner, quote, My dear Madhusudana, you know my strength, yet you are encouraging Bhadrasena and not me to challenge mighty Baladev. By this action you are simply insulting me because my arms are as strong as the bolts of the gate. Unquote. A devotee once said, quote, My dear Lord Krishna, may your challenger, Sridhama, become glorious for his chivalrous activities, such as vibrating like a thundercloud and roaring like a lion. May all glories go to Sridhama's chivalrous activities. Unquote. Chivalrous activities in the matter of fighting, charity, mercy, and execution of religious rituals are called constitutional, whereas expressions of pride, emotion, endurance, kindness, determination, jubilation, enthusiasm, jealousy, and remembrance are called unconstitutional. When Stoka Krishna, one of the many friends of Krishna, was fighting with him, his father chastised him for fighting with Krishna, who was the life and soul of all residents of Vrindavan. Upon hearing these chastisements, Stoka Krishna stopped his fighting. But Krishna continued to challenge him, and thus, in order to meet the challenge, Stoka Krishna took his pole and began to display his dexterity by whirling it. Once Sridhama challenged Bhadrasena and said to him, quote, My dear friend, you needn't be afraid of me yet. I shall first of all defeat our brother Balaram, and then I shall beat Krishna, and then I shall come to you. Unquote. Bhadrasena therefore left the party of Balaram and joined Krishna, and he agitated his friends as much as the Mandara hill had agitated the whole ocean. By his roaring sounds, he deafened all his friends, and he inspired Krishna with his chivalrous activities. Once Krishna challenged all his friends and said, quote, My dear friends, just see, I am jumping with great chivalrous prowess. Please do not flee away. Unquote. Upon hearing these challenging words, a friend named Varutapa counter-challenged the Lord and struggled against him. One of the friends once remarked, quote, Sudama is trying his best to see Damodar defeated, and I think that if our powerful Subala joins him, they will be a very beautiful combination, like a valuable jewel bedecked with gold. Unquote. In these chivalrous activities, only Krishna's friends can be the opponents. Krishna's enemies can never actually be his opponents. Therefore, this challenging by Krishna's friends is called devotional service in chivalrous activities. Dana vira, or chivalry in giving charity, may be divided into two parts, munificence and renunciation. A person who can sacrifice everything for the satisfaction of Krishna is called munificent. When a person desires to make a sacrifice because of seeing Krishna, Krishna is called the impetus of the munificent activity. When Krishna appeared as the son of Nanda Maharaj, in clear consciousness, Nanda Maharaj desired all auspiciousness for his son and thus began to give valuable cows in charity to all the Brahmins. The Brahmins were so satisfied by this charitable action that they were obliged to say that the charity of Nanda Maharaj had excelled the charity of such past kings as Maharaj Prithu and Riga. When a person knows the glories of the Lord completely and is prepared to sacrifice everything for the Lord, he is called Sampradhanaka, or one who gives everything in charity for the sake of Krishna. When Maharaj Yudhisthira went with Krishna in the arena of the Raja Surya sacrifice, in his imagination he began to anoint the body of Krishna with pulp of sandalwood. He decorated Krishna with a garland hanging down to his knees. He gave Krishna garments all embroidered with gold. He gave Krishna ornaments all bedecked with valuable jewels. 
and he gave Krishna many fully decorated elephants, chariots, and horses. He further wished to give Krishna in charity his kingdom, his family, and his personal self also. After so desiring, when there was nothing actually to give in charity, Maharaj Yudhishthir became very perturbed and anxious. Similarly, Maharaj Bali once told his priest, Shukracharya, quote, My dear sage, you are fully expert in knowledge of the Vedas, and as such, you worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Vishnu, by Vedic rituals. As far as this Brahmin, dwarf, the incarnation Vamanadeva is concerned, if he is Lord Vishnu, a simple Brahmin, or even my enemy, I have decided to give to him in charity all the land he has asked for." Unquote. Maharaj Bali was so fortunate that the Lord extended before him his hand, which was reddish from touching the breast of the goddess of fortune, who was always smeared with red kunkum powder. In other words, although the personality of Godhead is so great that the goddess of fortune is always under his command for enjoyment, he still extended his hands to take charity from Maharaj Bali. A person who wants to give everything in charity to Krishna but does not want anything in return is considered the real renouncer. Thus, a devotee will refuse to accept any kind of liberation, even if it is offered by the Lord. Real love of Krishna becomes manifested when Krishna becomes the recipient of charity and the devotee becomes the giver. In the Hari Bhakti Sudodaya, there is another example forwarded by Maharaj Dhruva. He says there, quote, My dear Lord, I have practiced austerities and penances because I was desiring to receive something from you. But in exchange, you have allowed me to see you, who are never visible even to the great sages and saintly persons. I had been searching out some pieces of broken glass, but instead I have found the most valuable jewel. I am therefore fully satisfied, my Lord. I do not wish to ask anything more from your Lordship." Unquote. A similar statement is to be found in the third canto of Śrīmad-Bhāgavatam, 15th chapter, verse 48. The four sages, headed by Sanaka Muni, address the Lord as follows, quote, Dear Supreme Personality of Godhead, your reputation is very attractive and free from all material contamination. Therefore, you are worthy of being glorified and are actually the reservoir of all places of pilgrimage. Auspicious persons who are fortunate enough to be engaged in glorifying your attributes and who actually know what your transcendental position is do not even care to accept liberation offered by you. Because they are so transcendentally enriched, they do not care to accept even the post of Indra, the heavenly king. They know that the post of the King of Heaven is also fearful, whereas for those who are engaged in glorifying your transcendental qualities, there is only joyfulness and freedom from all danger. As such, why should persons with this knowledge be attracted by a post in the Heavenly Kingdom?" Unquote. One devotee has described his feelings about the charity exhibited by King Mayuradvaj, quote, I am faltering even to speak about the activities of Maharaj Mayuradvaj, to whom I offer my respectful obeisances, unquote. Mayuradvaj was very intelligent, and he could understand why Krishna came to him once in the garb of a Brahmin. Krishna demanded from him half of his body to be sawed off by his wife and son, and King Mayuradvaj agreed to this proposal. 
On account of his intense feeling of devotional service, King Mayuradvaj was always thinking of Krishna. And when he understood that Krishna had come in the garb of a Brahmin, he did not hesitate to part with half of his body. This sacrifice of Maharaj Mayuradvaj for Krishna's sake is unique in the world and we should offer our all respectful obeisances to him. He had full knowledge of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in the garb of a Brahmin and he is known as the perfect Dhanavira or Renouncer. Any person who is always ready to satisfy Krishna and who is always dexterous in executing devotional service is called Dharma Vira or chivalrous in executing religious rituals. Only advanced devotees performing religious ritualistic performances can come to this stage of Dharma Vira. Dharma Viras are produced after going through the authoritative scriptures, following moral principles, being faithful and tolerant, and controlling the senses. Persons who execute religious rituals for the satisfaction of Krishna are steady in devotional service, whereas persons who execute religious rituals without intending to please Krishna are only called pious. The best example of a Dharma Vira is Maharaj Yudhishthir. A devotee once told Krishna, quote, My dear Krishna, O killer of all demons, Maharaj Yudhishthir, the eldest son of Maharaj Pandu, has performed all kinds of sacrifices just to please you. He has always invited the heavenly king, Indra, to take part in the yagyas or sacrifices. Because King Indra was thus absent so often from Shachi Devi, she had to pass much of her time pining over Indra's absence with her cheeks upon her hands." Unquote. The performance of different yagyas for the demigods is considered to be worship of the limbs of the Supreme Lord. The demigods are considered to be different parts of the universal body of the Lord and therefore the ultimate purpose in worshipping them is to please the Lord by partially worshipping his different limbs. Maharaj Yudhishthir had no such material desire. He executed all sacrifices under the direction of Krishna and not to take any personal advantage from them. He desired only to please Krishna and was therefore called the best of the devotees. He was always merged in the ocean of loving service. <laughs> <laughs> 